uh, global atmosphere, if you will. Certainly we had, uh, you know, uh, a little good, strong Canadian influence yesterday with uh, Brian Van Dormel, and uh, certainly welcome uh, another part of the globe this afternoon, and uh, I think it's a great opportunity uh, as we see these three gentlemen uh, frequently through the year and uh, through many events. Uh, this is one other time that we get to, uh, sh they get, we get to share their knowledge and uh, the experiences that, that they've had uh, globally. Um, they're going to uh, have lots of insight and in, in some of the changes and the developments and how they've grasped. Uh, on my left, Jan de Vries, and they'll give some introductions a little bit about uh, both their companies as well, but uh, Certainly, Jan is uh, um, a, a very significant player, and is, you certainly see his name uh, in an umbrella of companies, if you will, and I think it uh, certainly shows the team that he's built, the, uh, the admiration that he has for, for genetics and uh, for the industry as well, Jan. So there's, I won't touch on all your uh, umbrellas at this time. You can mention them, but certainly it's uh, been a pleasure to, uh, to get to know you the past number of years. And certainly when I have those opportunities, it's always at a, at a very strong event. It's well received. So uh, welcome and pleasure to have you here as well. Uh, Declan uh, Patton, I've got to know Declan uh, over the years. And he's got a little Australian accent. So if you can't understand everything he says, uh, you can get to join my place because I get to speak with him frequently. And I usually don't understand much that he says either. So. <laughs> I have asked him to kind of just uh, use a little more Illinois accent and a little less Australian today, but uh, we'll uh, participate as that. And certainly a, a, a breeder and uh, certainly a, a marketer through, uh, through many aspects of the country and at Butler View for the last little while. You can certainly see his, uh, his drive and his passion as well. And I've uh, got to know Declan in Australia uh, over my travels there and uh, certainly a great following. and. Uh, all kinds of innovation and uh, certainly uh, a great family of uh, partnerships and relationships that you've built there through the years. Uh, Paul Hunt uh, is with us today as well. Um, Paul's had a, a number of uh, passports, if you will, with uh, Canada, the U.S., and uh, the last uh, years, a few months uh, in Holland, and been at uh, Alta Genetics in his current position. He's been at Alta for uh, just over 20 years, and uh, currently uh, the COO of Alta Genetics, and uh, been a great friend and a great colleague uh, through the years as well. So, uh, welcome, welcome, Paul. But to show your welcome, as we uh, show your appreciation for these guys, as we uh, drain their brains for the next few minutes. So, welcome, guys. Uh, Jan, I'm going to start with you. I'd like, uh, certainly you've got a lot of uh, umbrellas, as I indicated, I think, from uh, uh, this group that they'd like to really hear about a little bit about uh, what, uh, what's behind uh, Jan de Vries and all the umbrellas that go. So a little overview of your company and uh, the current position and the teams that you've built, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a great honor to be here uh, after all these uh, tremendous speakers which we have heard. Uh, it's quite a task to sit here then. Um, well, my name is Jan de Vries, uh, born in Utrecht, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, my grandparents from both sides had uh, dairy farms. Uh, later my uncles uh, took over, the brothers of my, my parents. Um, I always worked there as a kid and uh, during university and school. Uh, in 1999, I came to the US to do a practical period for uh, German farms at the time. By the end of the practical period, I uh, get the choice what I wanted, uh, $1,000 or an embryo. At that time, I was not really involved in genetics or whatsoever, so I chose for the embryo. And that's where it was all starting. Um, the embryo later on changed into six embryos. We got uh, uh, three bulls, which all three went to AI, and then two heifers. So by the end, I had 26,000, which I thought it was a good business, so I had to go further in that. Um, in 2001, um, during my university, during my uh, study, I started uh, Diamond Genetics. It was a, a project for the university to start your own company. Um, we didn't stop after I finished university, but we con I continued. I uh, worked for one year, Holstein International. 
Um, but then it wasn't possible anymore to combine that with my uh, diamond genetics. Developed diamond genetics for uh, six years. Um, we did the sales for Eurogenes at the time. Then in 2006, uh, we purchased uh, Eurogenes. I forgot one important thing with we. It's uh, me and the company and uh, my partner, uh, Lama Tilema. Uh, Lama Tilema is 75. He's one of my father's best friends. Uh, he joined us in uh, 2002. Um, so in Eurogenes, we developed that for four years. Then in 2010, uh, the whole genomic thing came along and um, we, we realized that we had to do something if we wanted to, to stay in this business. Um, so at that time, we made some, uh, some, some steps. Uh, we purchased AMS Genetics in the US and started Holstein Plaza. Uh, we started with Worldwide Science Germany, uh, a trading company in Germany, Holstein Select. And we started trading companies, Diamond Genetics France and Diamond Genetics UK. All companies are independent. Uh, and then we also started in a business which we thought we would never go into, and that was the semen. So we went into uh, AI Total, uh, to joint venture with uh, AI Service Southwest Friesland, which is a group of inseminators in the north of the Netherlands. Um, so that was in 2010. Uh, we developed that for the last four years, and in 2014, we've started another company, AI Total US LLC. So that's the umbrella of companies that that I'm busy with the days. And uh, I guess just I'm going to ask a couple I, that I was. Uh, what about where's Holstein Plaza and Hotspots fall into that umbrella, uh, Jan? Just as you're giving your intro, please. Uh, Holstein Plaza is, um, falls under the AMS Genetics. And Hotspots, we started in 2010. Um, and Hotspots is kind of uh, covering, it's, it's made by all the people from all different companies, and we do that all together. Thank you. I think that's certainly a couple uh, entities that we see you know, frequently in the field, so I think it's good to touch on them as well. Uh, Declan, um, as you uh, introduced yourself and about your, your background and uh, how you see uh, things moving forward a little bit with some of your trends as well, as, uh, You've uh, been globally around as well. Yeah, thanks very much, Roger, and I'll try to speak as slowly as possible so everyone can understand me. Um, so, uh, yeah, as Roger mentioned, uh, I'm originally from Australia. Uh, I'll kind of work backwards a little bit. Um, so for the last, uh, because that's how us Australians do. So we, uh, I've, uh, for the last three years or two and a half years, I've been uh, working uh, at Butler View Farms uh, under Jeff Butler and family. Um, I uh, started there working in the barns, uh, milking the cows and, uh, you know, working hands-on. Uh, as time progressed, I started to do more of, uh, you know, more of the, uh, the sales and management roles. So currently my position at the farm is uh, the genetics and sales manager. Um, so a part of that umbrella is I uh, work with, uh, manage the Embro program uh, at Butler View. Uh, so currently we're IVFing roughly r around 85 donors every two weeks. And my job there is to do all the matings and manage that program. Also, with the uh, conventional flushing, uh, I guess that uh, entails the sales side of my business uh, of the business. So, uh, we I do a lot of uh, of the Embro sales globally. Um, so that's pretty much uh, uh, you know with a lot of other uh, responsibilities as well. But that's kind of the main uh, roles there I have at Butler View. Uh, before I worked at Butler View Farms, uh, I worked uh, three years with ABS uh, in Australia. Uh, so I started there uh, as a progeny test uh, coordinator. Um, so me and uh, another girl uh, did half of Australia Reach uh, in the regions. Uh, and so I worked with their Young Size program uh, and product development and also marketing uh, with ABS. Uh, my original uh, background is on a dairy farm. So my family had a 200 cow uh, Holstein dairy. We used to do a lot of showing of animals and I've, I guess I've always been interested in the genetic side. Um, and in Australia also I had an embryo business, designer embryos. So uh, that's pretty much sums up uh, most of my, uh, you know, responsibilities and a little bit of history on myself, so. Thanks, Declan. And uh, we understood you clearly, so well <laughs> done. Uh, Paul, you've uh, given a little introduction and certainly your position and certainly you've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of change as well as you've uh, uh, moved around globally as well. Paul Hunt. Thanks, Roger. Oh, I thought I was going to get off. No, I um, wasn't exactly sure how I got on the international panel because I think 
you know, when you're in the U.S., they kind of try and decide whether they're going to call Canada a partner or the 51st state or what it is. But I got thinking about all the other speakers, and I, I knew from the start I wasn't smart enough to get a PowerPoint presentation. I didn't get one of the real choice slots because it, you have to be really smart to do that, so I don't qualify for that. And I never bought a good enough bull to sit with the dirty half dozen that were up here <laughs> killing horses. I mean, I don't know if PETA is going to get real upset with them, but the number of horses those guys killed was incredible. <laughs> So I don't know, I, and I'm not young enough to sit with these guys. So I, I, I think Jeff just decided he'd throw me up here to see if he'd make me squirm. But as you said, I've, I've, uh, I've failed enough at what I've done to end up uh, 21 years with Alta, uh, currently chief operating officer, which allows me to do, I guess, a lot of things I like. Um, the uh, uh, have done. A lot of different uh, things sold, started out more like Declan selling embryos and live cattle in 1994, went through uh, uh, marketing, sales, RSA work, didn't buy any good bulls. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, uh, came into the role of uh, chief operating officer, right now responsible for product development, uh, peak program, the uh, housing and distribution of semen, sales in Russia. Uh, I haven't met Putin, but he seems like a nice guy. <laughs> if you're listening, Mr. Putin, that was for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's been a, a great ride. Uh, uh, 21 years with one company seems like a long time, but uh, when I saw the, seems like the, uh, there was a lot of 20-year uh, people in all these things. It takes a lot of passion to be in our industry. I think that's, uh, I think that's the one thing that I r always appreciate about coming to any event like this. Uh, we're not maybe we don't have a thousand people in the room, but if we look at each person and the reason they're here, what I find uh, pretty unique is the incredible level of passion that each person has for their role and position within the uh, within our industry. And I really commend uh, uh, the the sponsor, the people putting this together, Jeff, the hosting world, uh, Jetstream, in bringing such a passionate group of people together. So uh, hopefully we uh, we explore some of that passion on the international base. Um, I think, I'll, I think that's, I'll try and keep mine about there. Hey, that's great, Paul. Certainly, I've been able to. The one important thing that Paul just didn't mention that uh, one of the first jobs he ever had was he worked for me. So he, uh, he worked for me for a week, and he lost about 18 pounds that time. So I guess if he tolerated that, then uh, things went on quite a bit faster after he got over that speed bump. So. Uh, Declan, uh, kind of going through a little bit of some questions, and certainly Australia, as you know, everybody globally looks at it with, uh, you know, as uh, not only a getaway place for us cold climate guys in the in the winter time, but certainly with the uh, there's been a lot of changes within the industry down there, uh, reseller market, uh, certainly a different structure than a lot of other countries, and you know, uh, grazing and their exports that they've been attracted to over the years, they've experienced a lot of things and. With your, um, your knowledge and certainly with your farming background, I think you could share some trends and some market appeal that uh, Australia has experienced uh, down under. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Roger. Um, I guess I'd like to start to say, uh, uh, start with that, uh, you know, what I've been getting from the conference, uh, the, you know, the last couple of days that, you know, one thing I wanted to touch on is, uh, you know, we need cows that are, you know, medium size with a lot of strength and that lasts a long time. So I'm not sure why John Sheffers didn't think Australia had good cows. So, <laughs> But uh, yeah, just to give a little bit of an overview of Australia, uh, we have uh, over 6,500 dairy farms. Uh, we produce around 9.5 billion litres of milk uh, per year. Uh, we have around 1.7 uh, million dairy cows. And uh, you know, our average herd size is obviously you know, quite large. So we're around uh, you know, 280 cows is our average herd in Australia. Uh, obviously, a majority of that is uh, pasture-based, so it makes us a little bit, a uh, little bit uh, different to obviously North America. Um, but we're a 13 billion dollar, you know, industry uh, within Australia with our agricultural uh, industry, and about four billion dollars to our, uh, you know, farm gate. So, but obviously, you know, being a pasture-based system, you know, we have a, uh, you know, a different, uh, different index. Um, but you know, I think the changes and the trends, you know, where. Uh, different parts of Australia um, are rapidly changing. So, you know, we're going more from uh, from a pasture-based system 
to a system where you know we're having a lot of more inputs, a lot of more supplements. Uh, you know, and we see that as a growing trend, and because of that, we're seeing a lot you know a lot of different use in uh, you know with the size selections and with the management of our uh, of our animals. So, you know, genomics is certainly one thing that uh, you know is uh, you know growing in Australia. Um, it's taken a little bit more time to to see that trend grow. Uh, certainly on the male side, uh, you know, with my experience with ABS, uh, we were selling quite a lot of genomic semen. Um, but, you know, with our systems, and I guess we'll touch on that a little later, but with our APR system, uh, but our change in management, we're looking at more of the North American uh, genetics, you know, so the TPI, uh, the LPI. So, you know, we see, uh, you know, a rapid growth in, in genomic uh, technology uh, from, from North America. So. I think that's one of you know probably the major changes um, you know going from pasture based to uh, you know more supplementary uh, you know diets. We'll see that continue to grow in the country, and you know a lot of that is due to the weather patterns. You know Australia can be hot one day, it can be cold the next. Uh, luckily, not as cold as Illinois, um, but you know the weather can uh, it can be quite dry in the country. So people are looking at you know uh, using supplements for you know for our herds. It's a little bit easy to manage. So. Yeah, I think that's, you know, certainly, you know, when uh, you get a, one of your bushfires, uh, by the time it gets on the media over here, we don't think there's anything left of Australia, <laughs> but uh, they, they take it a little bit out of proportion sometimes. But certainly you guys are a pretty resilient group, you know, certainly drought has, has changed the course of a lot of farmers in the regions over there, and, uh, and certainly the, uh, the fires have taken a lot of acreage and a lot of farms over time as well, but uh, they can seem to uh, certainly uh, battle on as well. Uh, Jan, um, certainly with uh, well, you've seen as much in your short period of time and certainly had a lot of uh, diff war different hats getting there. So a uh, little overview on perspective and how uh, some of the trends that you've seen and uh, within your umbrella. Okay, thank you. Um, well, if I look at the, what's happening currently in, uh, in Europe is uh, that the quota system is, uh, is disappearing. We're a couple of weeks away from that. And that's going to influence um, uh, the dairy industry uh, quite a bit. Um, we see farms getting bigger and bigger in a, in a rapid scale. Um, farms who want to stop raising their own young stock um, and uh, just mil milk cows. Uh, if you look from the Netherlands, um, the land is always the limiting factor. It's a very expensive and they put up now strict manure rules and uh, mineral rules for how many animals you can have uh, pro hectare. Uh, so for that reason, it, it, it doesn't pay off to raise your own young stock and even um, uh, breeders, which we have worked with for, for many years uh, and who does, do a lot of flushes, now call us if we want to take over their young uh, stock rearing and, and, and deliver uh, two-year-olds. So that's going to be quite an impact in, for the upcoming period on the, how, how is that going to influence everything. Um, the politics is also getting really involved in that. We got a new uh, dairy industry law uh, coming up, uh, and they have uh, clear ideas about the, the maximum size of cows. And in some provinces, you're not allowed to, to or it's very difficult to get licenses for b uh, building uh, uh, dairy farms over 500 cows. So um, that's a little bit of political situation in the moment. Then we have the of course, the genomic uh, discussion and acceptance and all of that. Um, I've also been a little bit active myself in that discussion. Um, in Europe, it's still like it was here uh, in the beginning, that it's uh, restricted access to the AIs and uh, uh, co-ops who have formed that. And there's now coming some change in that. Uh, the Germans, they want to uh, open it and come with a system similar to the US. Uh, other European countries are not in favor of that. And uh, there comes to a point that uh, maybe your genomics is going to split um, with the ones uh, with France and the Netherlands and then Viking, uh, Scandinavian one group, and the Germans on the other one. Um, that's going to be interesting to see how that will go. Uh, they are discussing a, a formula, a new index that should be a, a counterpart or an alternative for the TPI. So we're going to see how that's going to develop. Um, that's most of what. Yeah, hey, that's good. <laughs> uh, certainly, there's, there's certainly it'll, it'll drive some questions, uh, Jan. So I mean. Uh, 
Uh, we certainly realize that uh, English is your second language, and you certainly do a tremendous job at it. So uh, coming down to uh, Paul, and certainly, you know, with uh, wearing lots of different hats, you might come at their, our question a little uh, differently approached, but certainly uh, welcome your, your market trends, uh, changes, and in intro. Thank you. Yeah, if I, uh, if I look at the trend, I think the panel today talks about one of the trend, and I think the, the biggest trend we're faced with is, is globalization of our industry. I think there's a number of uh, drivers of that. First of all, uh, consolidation. Uh, there's fewer and fewer companies out there, and that's not just in the AI business. That's, that's in uh, milk production, milk marketing. Uh, we see a lot of globalization going on. We see more and more need to collaborate to have the, the scale that's needed to uh, meet producer needs. And uh, you know, specific to today's meetings, we see, I think we see that genetics is beginning to play a role with the rate of genetic gain that, uh, that we're making. Uh, dairymen who are able to make that genetic gain are more likely to be in the business now and in the future. And so genetics is, act, I think, is one of the big drivers of that consolidation, globalization. Uh, it, given that we're here in the US, I think one of the big drivers of that uh, globalization is also the fact that we're, uh, as the slide, great slides yesterday showed, we're at the heart of uh, genetic improvement for the Holstein breed. When we see the scale of reproduction, the quality of genetics, I think if, uh, if, if y as Jan wishes would come true and we had a genomic test on every animal on every base so that they all, all had some reason to sell, I think what we'd find is that probably the highest animal on almost every base likely was born here in the U.S. It's just the scale of, of reproduction that takes place, the quality of animals. We all want uh, highly productive, healthy cows. Some people want them to look good, some people don't. We can argue about that one. I think when they look better, it's obviously better. Why have ugly cows? But we see that uh, genetics is a real driver to that globalization and uh, consolidation. I think, uh, I think a great trend that uh, I like to celebrate, or I think we can all celebrate, is the value of genetics. Uh, we'd, uh, we'd not done a great job as an industry, uh, I think, sh selling and promoting the value that uh, lie in genetics, and I think uh, genomics has been a real, a real boon for us in that regard, a real help. Uh, we look at, uh, at least from, from what uh, the one company knowledge I have, we see more and more units of semen being sold. We see people trusting in genetics, realizing that if they spend more for a better genetics, they're going to get better results. Uh, it's that kind of trusting relationship that I think uh, helps us to, to uh, get over the initial uh, lukewarm feelings that may have existed in some areas on genomics. I think everybody's finding that uh, it's not quite the, the, the terrible uh, unknown that uh, some people some people are worried about. So I think, uh, again, we're going to end the conference with what, uh, what I think is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we are in a world that needs protein. We create protein in a lot of different ways. We've attracted a lot of uh, of uh, people to our industry because of that need, but also because we have a science-based uh, approach to value creation. I think we're gonna see that when we look at the, the animals that are leading that genetic improvement uh, head, to the, head to the auction block tonight, that uh, we'll see that respect uh, shown in, in the, the cap great American way, a capitalist way. And, uh, and I think that's a real, a real uh, uh, testament to where the industry has is, is been professionalized and taken to a new level of uh, performance. I do think it's, it's great to have a conference like this. I think the one trend that, I don't know if it's a trend, but I, I think we're in, in the middle of a game change. I think it, uh, it's always tough to step far enough back when you're going 100 miles an hour to know what the real changes are. Um, I heard a number of people you know, talk about uh, uh, you know, trends in the industry you know, may sound a little, uh, little bit self-serving, but uh, people say, hey, you know, Alta doesn't buy as many bulls as they used to. Well, I used to like when we could buy 200 bulls for a little under $2 million, and that, that worked good. And then we started this genomics things, and the bulls got more expensive. And yes, we bought fewer of them, but then we had to spend more money. And uh, then you start hearing the stories, well, the bulls were so expensive, they started buying females, and that's cutting breeders out well. I look at the amount of money that it costs to buy females and the reproduction work you have to do, and I think we went from two million to uh, a lot more million pretty quick. And I'm not a I'm not a hundred percent sure that the math uh, plays out that uh, 
that there still isn't a real symbiotic relationship with, uh, with AI and, uh, and female programs. When I look at uh, 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 even our program, we're, we're not going to have enough diversity in genetics to ever be closed. I think it was Lloyd who uh, may have said that earlier. We're going to need to continue to rely, rely on the population, the great breeders that, out, that are out there to, uh, to, to you know, still be the engine of, uh, of our genetic improvements. So my trends would be globalization, genetics have value, and uh, we're in the middle of a game change, but uh, don't believe the hype. Yeah, I think, Paul, you touch on uh, all kinds of uh, main items in the news today, and, and even when you talk about your female program and, and how some farms have adapted to the services that, uh, you know, the you, you as a company need or, or other farmers need or other, you know, other breeders and those services and how they've had to make a, you know, a swing towards uh, supplying and uh, providing those services and making a, making a total business out of it. So I think you, you make the change, you see the, the collaboration and how it's changed and shifted over the time as, as well is quite important. Yeah, and I'm going to start with you on our next one because you were, you're pretty passionate about the, uh, the different genomic blocks, if you will. So I'm, I'm going to, and certainly with, uh, you know, in, in Holland with NVI and, you know, closely with uh, RZG as well, you can touch on them. Uh, what do you feel the major strengths of them are? And you can, you know, work your own opinion in on your, on that uh, collaboration as well with, uh, with those indexes uh, uh, in Europe. Um. Well, each index has, of course, its own uh, uh, formula and how it, it, it comes together. Um, you see that in um, uh, a group of index, if you have the PFT, the Italian index, the Canadian index, and, the, and also the German index, they are uh, quite similar. If you've got the type and, uh, and protein and milk, uh, you, you do score well on, on most of these indexes. Where you have the, the French and the Danish and now also a little bit more the, the TPI, if you have your uh, health traits and, and uh, these, tr then you, you do really well in, in these indexes. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, you know, as, as you market a lot through a lot of those different indexes, it becomes, uh, you know, what, what do people want? Uh, what are they trying to make uh, with that? And some of what are your, particular in your case, some of your embryo markets are, are driven by some of those indexes as well, I would assume. Yeah, well, for us, it's the main, in two main indexes uh, at the moment are still uh, by far TPI. Uh, it's worldwide accepted as the index. Um, and then second to that is uh, the RZG, which is, uh, which is a very important index. Uh, it's partly because of uh, uh, the Germans are most liberal in, uh, in uh, releasing their data. So you, the, the people, they know the, the ranking the best. And the... German AIs have, have paid the most money for bulls in Europe, and money uh, money counts for when you when you want to breed for something. So these two indexes are. No, I think it's 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 good to hear your perspective because you work in many of them. I think it uh, you know, uh, even though they have adjustments and they have their strengths, it comes down to profit and what's going to return for for yourself and for those clients as well. Um, moving into that, uh, Paul, I'd ask for some input with uh, some of your you know, connections that uh, you've experienced with those, those indexes as well and uh, share your views. Yeah, I, I think we get, uh, we often get quite wrapped up in the, the different indexes and, and I actually was refreshing in a number of the presentations from the people who make the indexes. They, they maybe take themselves less serious than I was concerned they did. You know, we, we, all, we all want to breed, uh, again, cows that make high quantities of high quality milk in an easy way and uh, there's not too many different ways. There's not too many ways to skin that cat. Uh, we've got GTPI, I agree with Jan, it's, it's the global language. I have the distinct pleasure of being born an English speaker, which means everybody else uh, caters to your needs. It's what GTPI is. It's the English language of breeding. It's the easiest to understand. It's the most common, and it, and it becomes a dominant, uh, dominant force. Again, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the size and scale of the U.S. population. I think those secondary indexes, uh, LPI, TP, uh, RZG, PFT, all the different letters of the alphabet, I think, I think those, are, those are generally uh, well thought out uh, 
indexes that really work for the local commercial dairymen. Um, you know, in, in the past, they, they were more relevant to the breeding, to the breeder population, because the breeders in those countries needed to supply the genetics to them. But again, I think we're at a stage now where, where, we, uh, where we're pretty multilingual. We're going to see, uh, again, using the example of tonight's sale, we, we're going to see animals promoted on four different bases uh, with great accuracy. Uh, you can pick and choose which ones are important to you, but the beauty of it is, is that you know which the best animals are, and I think that's a that's a real benefit uh, to say that you know this animal may be more moderate for TPI, but she's got a great RZ G. It makes her relevant, uh, that makes her have value beyond uh, a milk producing unit. So I do think those secondary indexes pr provide a nice support or a nice side benefit. Uh, I still think TPI is 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 going to lead uh, TPI. I think the U.S. population and GPTAs are going to lead the the genetic improvement, and I think uh, we'll see the globalization, and we'll see more and more, uh, more and more people relying on the on the U.S. to to make that genetic improvement. Thanks, Paul. Um, Declan, with uh, certainly APR, and you know, so you can touch on that. And certainly, you've been marketing a number of embryos for a number of years, and uh, with over here on primarily on GTPI, I guess. Uh, what do you see, and where's where's that? Uh, focus and driven with amongst your clients as, as well with the strength within those uh, indexes. Yeah, for sure, Roger. Uh, obviously, the APR is the Australian profit ranking, so it's, uh, it's like the GTPI or the RZG in Germany. Um, you know, and I guess the strength of that, you know, of that uh, ranking is for pasture-based systems. Uh, so if you're a, a farmer in Australia and you have a pasture-based system, then that, uh, the APR system is certainly one that you'll, uh, that you'll turn to. If you're a you know producer in Australia and you're a TMR herd or you know you supplement supplementary feed, then a lot of those farmers in the past have uh, turned to the TPI system. Uh, like both of the uh, guys up here have said, it's a, a global system that uh, everyone respects, uh, and especially when you're looking at genomics. Um, you know well, the one thing when I started with ABS was that they said genomics is only as good as your data set. Uh, so. Obviously, with the APR system, we're in the infancy of, uh, of genomic testing in Australia, uh, so we don't have a wide, wide data set with APR. Uh, and that's probably one reason that uh, genomics on the TPI system uh, or on the LPI system have uh, played a, a larger role in Australia. Uh, as Roger mentioned, on the embryo side, um, my job is the sales manager at Butley Viano Embryos, and we sell uh, roughly around $2 million of embryos each year. So it's certainly something that we, uh, you know, that I focus on quite heavily. And, uh, you know, like uh, it's been said today, you've got to know your customers. Uh, and a lot of our customers are based out of Europe. Uh, so we actually look, when I started at Butler View, kind of looked at a lot of those different systems. So we do a lot of mating selections on, uh, on RZG. Uh, we, we use a lot of balls that rank well in that country because that's, you know, a lot of the time our end user. So that's quite important. Uh, and, you know, it, it plays a, a larger role in, you know, different systems are starting to play, you know, a much larger role, you know, in, uh, in our breeding program. So, um, yeah, that's probably, uh, you know, the main points I'd like to touch on. Yeah, certainly, and certainly strong points, uh, Declan. I think, uh, you know, APR doesn't always get, uh, you know, get in the forefront sometimes, but uh, when you get the chance to be there, that's certainly what gets circulated uh, mm -hmm. first and foremost within the country. And I think... Uh, you know, as, as being there a number of times and the implementations they've made uh, to try and grasp that uh, feed efficiency and uh, body size condition has certainly uh, always impacted um, a lot of the drivers be behind those changes uh, as well. And I think uh, kind of leads into our, our next uh, little segment about, you know, is it practical to, to breed for multiple, you know, uh, indexes? And I'm going to start with Paul on this one. Um, how do you feel about that? Is it practical? And certainly as a, as a peak program, you know, is that something you guys are trying to do inside your program uh, as well at Alta, Paul? The, uh, it's going to help. The, uh, from, from that perspective, I think selection for, for multiple systems, is it possible? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, we, we had the good fortune, uh, and it was good luck, not uh, always great planning. We have a one of the animals within our program, uh, uh, Ransom Marquis is her name. She's in the top 
two or three uh, animals born in 2013 on LPI, TPI, NVI, and RZG. She, I assume if we found some other indexes to test her on, she'd likely, likely be in the top for those. Again, we're looking for all the same things. I guess the question is, is it practical? Well, um, the last time I checked, again, this is a business, uh, you don't generally work to turn gold into silver. And so uh, TPI is what drives uh, the financials uh, of our business, of the breeding industry very much. It's always nice to pick up those extra uh, byproduct checks, if you will, when you can sell a, a, a female or a male based on uh, LPI, RZG, those other things. But ultimately, I, I think uh, what, what I see really transitioning and changing in our business is the, the focus and commitment and scale that's required uh, to breed cattle is, is really being raised. Uh, I think in the past, the analogy would have been that and many of the great breeders were great. Uh, I do think they used art and practical uh, common sense to, to make the foundation of the great Holstein breed. But uh, today, I think we've really moved to a, to a situation where Holstein cattle breeding takes uh, a level of focus and commitment that makes it more of a sport. Uh, it's a, you, wanna, you wanna be good at it, you have to be focused, you have to be committed, you have to train to do it well. Um, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's like the example of a decathlon. I, I think if you can do 10 sports, that's great, but nobody knows who does it. It's not that cool. Uh, it's the people, you know, it's, it's Usain Bolt's the fastest and some Kenyan runs the, fa the longest uh, time. You, the specialists are the people who are gonna win uh, when it comes to it. So uh, for me, it's that focus and uh, commitment. Again, still that same basis of passion that's required, but it's scale and focus and commitment. And so. I really think uh, it's not overly practical to try and do, be good at everything. You need to decide what you're gonna be good at. Again, I, it's a common theme that uh, has come up in, from different angles, uh, from different uh, people who are up here killing horses. But uh, for me, I, I, I would liken it to the fact that, uh, you know, no longer it's Monday night football, it's Tuesday morning genomics that, uh, that's the, the sport of kings uh, in this room. I was going to give you a welcome to the U.S., but uh, maybe after Monday Night Football just got trashed. I'm, I'm not sure. Just, just, just for those who are worried, I am moving to Wisconsin. I'm a Packers fan. I won't. <laughs> who's their, uh, who's good, their quarterback? Good cover. Uh, Declan, I'm going to, you know, as you talk about some of your indexes, and, and, and obviously people ask you for a lot of advice and, and selection as well, and, and I'm just going to add a little bit of a question on that. You talked about some of your embryo clients. I'm going to just, as you sell a lot of embryos, is, is your primary client uh, breeders or AI companies, uh, particularly as you export? You can, if you can kind of turn that into the same question. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, certainly, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm a bit of a numbers guy, so I like to analyze a lot of data that we have uh, at the farm. Um, I guess to answer that, the question, um, we're actually 50-50. Uh, so we sell, 50% uh, of our embryos would sell direct to farmers around the world. And then the other 50% uh, we sell through brokers. Uh, so like uh, Jan's uh, company, Eurogenes, uh, we sell quite a few embryos through brokers uh, around the world. So obviously, you know, I was quite surprised when I ran the numbers, but it's a 50-50 relationship. So it obviously for, for my business, it shows how important, uh, you know, uh, dealing directly with the farmer is, and it shows how important that, uh, you know, brokers around the world are as well for, for our business. Uh, but, you know, certainly as I touched on before, uh, Roger, you know, the, our, our big clientele is in Europe. Um, so, you know, we want, uh, we want an animal uh, for our breeding program uh, that may rank well on GTPI, but we also want an animal that ranks well on, you know, some of those systems as well. Certainly that's where our clients are. So we have to look at their system and we have to adapt and change. Uh, and that's certainly something that we've done, you know, for the last few years. And, and as those systems uh, become more important, you know, we've adapted to, to that change. Um, so we pay a lot of attention on the RZG uh, when, we, when we're mating sires. And uh, we certainly want bulls and heifers that rank well in, you know, three or four systems. Um, so if they can rank well in the Italian system or if they can rank well in, you know, the GTPI, LPI. You know, that's important for us, you know, because that, that way I can maximize, uh, you know, the investment uh, on that animal. So that, you know, that's one of my key roles at the farm is to maximize investment for the people that own the animals. Uh, and certainly if they rank well in those different systems, you know, that allows me to do that. So, I, you know, I think it's a key driver for what I do, um, but certainly, you know, in other areas it may not be. So, 
Yeah, good. Certainly, it's uh, it's always interesting and in how those relationships are important with within that as well. And on this question, you know, it uh, it really hit me last year when I was uh, you know over with you in Germany. You know, we you had one of your live cattle sales and uh, one of your your top seller that day. Certainly had GTPI. She certainly had RZG, and and then she was purchased by a guy that lives in Canada and breeds for GLPI. So I, I thought that was really interesting. So, you know, it's certainly a heifer that you guys had your hands in. Um, I th so certainly she had a global attraction, you know, and certainly she touched a lot of bases. So I think uh, you have a lot of uh, influence and input to uh, how you feel those practicalities of those indexes blend. Yes, especially for these top animals, it doesn't really matter anymore uh, where they are, if they are in uh, Germany, Canada, or whatever, Argentina or what, Australia, whatever country they are, they're going to be found and, and people want to work with them. So uh, that was at that time that the top heifer in, in Germany sold to uh, the Canadians. Um, what we feel in, in choosing uh, our mating size is that we, we, f we see it as an extra safety if they rank well in uh, as well the European system as well in the, in the US system. As long as there are enough um, uh, uh, the sires have enough data in the reference population. It, uh, it, you know, you need to have enough uh, daughters in the reference population. Uh, bulls like Robust, who had no daughters in the reference population in, in Europe, it, it, it does not make much sense to rank their Robust daughters based on the European rankings. But if you've got bulls like we now see with, with the planet suns and so on that have uh, uh, daughters on both sides of the ocean, then it it gives us an extra safe, you know, we feel more comfortable if they rank well in both systems. So that we like to see that. Yeah, great. I think it's, uh, and you can see the rewards when they, when they do have the polish of, of all of them and combined into one as well. As we talked to even earlier this morning with the, uh, with the AI group and uh, they're seeing their changes with genomics versus proven. I think it's always interesting even within countries and uh, Declan, I'm going to you know start with you on this one. And what was the the usage of genomic young sires, if you will, prior to genomics uh, within uh, within Australia? And where do you see it currently on those uh, amongst the breeders um, within the country? Yeah, for sure, Roger. I think uh, you know Australia, uh, you know, as a as a population likes uh, type cattle. Um, you know, obviously we all like to milk good cows, but you know Australia does put a bit of emphasis on the type. Um, so. When I started back in ABS in 2009, um, you know, it was right about the start uh, of aftershock and destry. Uh, so it was my first day on the job, and I remember uh, Russell Manton come up to me and he said, have a look at these, you can't tell anyone, but, uh, and he showed me a genomic proof on destry and aftershock. Uh, those two bulls, we sold that much semen on it, you know, it was incredible. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of uh, breeders in Australia that, you know, f followed the genomic type, and I, and I think we've, you know, we've discovered some of the greatest bulls in, you know, in, in history with, you know, Atwood and, and certainly Gold Chip and, and there's many more, as I mentioned, after Shock and Destry. So, you know, I think on the genomic type side, uh, Australia is still, uh, you know, very passionate about, you know, about genomics on that. Um, and, you know, with the proven bulls, um, obviously, you know, we still have quite a, a high use of proven bulls on the, uh, you know, on the production side. So, you know, Australian breeders, uh, you know, depending, as I touched on before, on the systems, Kind of depends if you're a pasture-based system or if you're on a, uh, you know, on a, you know, on a uh, total mix ration. You know, each breeding program have uh, different objectives, but certainly we see more of the proven bulls probably used on the uh, on the pasture-based, and uh, because you know that's what uh, works with the APR. Um, on genomic APR, it's probably one of the only systems in the world I've seen that uh, the proven bulls are higher than the genomic bulls on on APR. Uh, certainly, you don't see that on many systems. So I think uh, the pasture-based uh, you know, farmers use a lot of proven bulls. And then on the, uh, you know, management side on the uh, your TMR and, and feed, you know, feedlots, uh, you know, we see more of the, you know, the young genomic bulls coming through because I think it suits that system. Uh, and obviously they're looking at, you know, more of the North American influence on, uh, on, on those bulls. So. Yeah, it's interesting that how it even is split within a, in, in amongst the population within the country, how it gets split up that you don't always, uh, you don't always see as well. Uh, Ian, certainly is uh, Holland and your friendly neighboring countries, where do you see and how, what have you noticed in those genomic uh, sire, proven sire trends? 
Um, well, in, in the Netherlands, it was uh, it took off a little slower than in other countries. Um, I would say it was mostly for for two reasons. Uh, first, we had uh, the press who was in the beginning quite skeptical to uh, to genomics, and the second was the uh, the, tr the Siemens sales companies. Uh, they 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 stayed uh, selling uh, daughter proven product for uh, quite a long time. Um, uh, NVI is the, the formula in the Netherlands, and uh, they obviously only had the uh, data on their daughter proven bulls, so for that reason they could not compete with, uh, with young bulls because they do not have GNVIs on those. Um, so for that reason, now that is changing with the GMAs, that uh, more of these companies uh, have access to uh, GNVIs on their bulls, so they also act actively start marketing the, those bulls and therefore uh, also, their clients are now changing to it. Um, Germany has a huge acceptance of genomics. Uh, it, it's much higher than in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, France is, is, is really high. Uh, Scandinavia seems to be uh, quite high. I'm not really into that. Um, uh, England is a little bit more um, slower than other, tr more traditional than, than, than other European countries. So those yeah, are the are. countries that we are active in. Always interesting when you get uh, politicals, uh, politics into the landscape as well that, uh, you know, you always ask yourself, is it uh, coming at the cost of genetic progress uh, within the country as well? So, uh, Paul, moving on to you with that uh, question and uh, certainly within the scope of the AI company and, and as you've seen uh, sales and business and the trends as well. So, so yeah, as, uh, as we make no... Uh, illusion about, and John probably showed uh, with full colors. Uh, in terms of genomics, Alta's drank the Kool-Aid. We're uh, very committed. Uh, you know, it, it suits our, our clientele very well, and uh, we've, uh, we were early adopters, so we're, we're uh, we've, in the five years that uh, have been completed, I, that I would call in the genomic era, we've gone from uh, about under 30% genomics to nearly 70% genomics in terms of our global sales. And of course, uh, we would be higher percentages in the U.S. and Germany and Canada, and little lower percentages in some of the countries, as Jan mentioned, that either have political or, or skeptical reasons for not uh, being genomic. The uh, the that trend is is an interesting one because it would lead you to believe that there's less proven semen being sold, but in in fact, what it what it amounts to is that at Alta, at least 100% of our growth has been genomic. We still sell as many proven units today as we did five years ago. It's just that the growth has come on the side of, uh, of genomic bulls. And I, and I think we have to look at the landscape that, that uh, genomics was introduced in. Uh, when genomics came out, we had likely what I would argue uh, was the testament to the quality of, of uh, great breeding. We had what I think is one of the greatest crops of, of bulls. When you look at bulls like Alta Iota, Dorsey, Freddy, Ostile, Shottle, Planet, that, those group of proven bulls held up there very long and very well. And so it was, it was a time when we were trying to introduce a new technology in the face of a very strong and established uh, uh, group of bulls. And it, it may have made it a challenge at first. And uh, we, we've, I think we've succeeded. We see the, the quality of genetics and, and genomics. And, and uh, we see the influence that those great bulls have had in terms of you know, today creating all the questions about uh, uh, about outcross and the need for uh, outcross, I just editorialize. If if anybody in the audience started buying outcross, we'd we'd start making it. Um, <laughs> the uh, the interesting thing I think will be is I think we're in again in a little bit of a valley. We had that great group of of daughter proven bulls that existed at the top of the list, were very well proven, uh, very accurately proven, that uh, held on very strong, and now we're going through a phase of of that. Uh, uh, you know, distance from K. I heard that earlier. I don't really know what that means, but we're we're getting a little more uh, of a challenge there in terms of reliability. But uh, we're going to have a renaissance for daughter proven bulls. I think when uh, when we find out which of the mogul ransom bulls that are out there that look good right now is really the best one, he's going to rank pretty well even against the very youngest bulls. And and when we start having uh, we we have the diversity of all the different bloodlines is a great opportunity for genomics. When we have, and I call him a double genomic, uh, a bull whose sire and maternal grandsire are both genomic at the time of sampling, when we find out through daughter proofs 
which of those was the best, the best combination, had rolled the right luck, they're going to rank extremely high. We look at how high Mogul ranks still now. Wait till we see which of those Mogul robust sons is really the best one. He's going to rank darn high against even some real young bulls. So I think there will be a renaissance. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got the, the fact that not as many people want to buy them. They make a lot of semen. They're going to be high. They're going to be priced right. I think we're going to continue to see a real strong relevance of, of daughter-proven bulls uh, moving forward. I don't, I don't see us going to uh, chopping bulls' heads off when they're 36 months of age. At least that's my prediction. Yeah, that's good. I think, uh, you know, those, those, there's only so many barns and so many stalls, but we get, you need units to, to get there, and certainly the clients are, are the drivers behind that. Kind of coming up to one final question before we open it up to the floor. Um, as we heard from different aspects and the return on investment and, you know, certainly presentation yesterday about uh, genomic testing, as many females as you can, increase in the, the reference population. Uh, Ian, starting with you, is this a, a tool or, you know, um, something that you see within Holland that they are large herds or commercial herds are doing a lot of genomic testing within a within a herd environment? Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's really uh, promoted big by, by uh, the local herd books in, in Europe uh, because they need it for their uh, reference population to get enough data. Um, uh, they think with the preferable treatment that we now see on the, on the bulls that are being used that they need more female input data to keep, their, to, yep. to keep the reliability up. So it's it, it, it really promoted and you see it's a, is a tool, you know, certainly with, with uh, when you put dollars to it, it, it's interesting to see that it's being grasped and hopefully that uh, that database and that reference population will keep moving it uh, forward as well. You know, Paul, you come from different uh, populations as well, but, uh, you know, certainly um, Alta's grabbed a hold of that genomic testing um, as well. Um, when I was there, it was uh, certainly, uh, you know, as, as you used the word promotion, you guys used it as a tool. Um, in-house and, and globally, uh, what's your perspective on, on uh, commercialization uh, genomic testing? Yeah, so uh, on, on the side of, uh, of uh, genomic testing, I think there's a lot of different facets to it. It's done, obviously, uh, very intensively within this room, within the breeding population or the near breeding population, which I think is what we, we, uh, we would call anybody who's a, who's a purebred um, focused on breeding herd. But we see it really moving uh, rapidly into the commercial population. I think again, it's a little bit goes back to the third trend I mentioned. Under trends, we're in such a fast rate of change. We're not exactly sure how even best to use the technology. And so it's not just it's um, it, it's no different than a new drug for a for a protocol that you might use. We're still trying to find the best ways to incorporate it. And so uh, I had. I got to have lunch with Soetis and, and we talked about that. And when, you, when you're looking to try and incorporate these tools, you, it, it takes some time to find, to I think, uh, always find the right uh, and, and most fruitful path. Uh, I think we have to be, and I was, you know, not surprised, but really glad to hear that everybody was very honest on the AI panel, as we always are. You know, we, we, we can't hold the illusion that, uh, that testing animals that are three, four, five hundred GTPI points behind the, the mean of AI bulls is, is going to hold a lot of fruitful value to the breeding population. We need to find ways to, to maintain that relevance and keep them engaged. Um, you know, I, I would add to Jan's statement about uh, herd books doing testing in Europe. I do think, again, RZG and GTPI in the reverse order are are popular indexes because they're widely available. The drawback of being widely available is it's hard to protect any value. When we look at the more protected uh, indexes that happen in some other countries, I do see a lot of interesting work, at least I, I look at it as interesting work being done on feed efficiency, hoof health, these type of things, because they hope to have some means of capturing that, uh, that value. And so I think that's a, an advantage or opportunity for those secondary breeding populations to be looking for, for areas of value in terms of proprietary information on some of these, these uh, emerging areas. I, I, I think it's going to be very hard for that to be developed within a, the intensely competitive uh, GTPI marketplace. In terms of commercial testing, uh, 
again, I, I think it's a, we're just, we're at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, uh, again, it's, it's a simp it's, it has to be simple for me to understand. If, if genomic testing was free, you'd always do it. it. If it was, if you can define more and more ways to create value through it, it'll become more and more prevalent. And I think as we become more uh, adept, maybe more uh, 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 focused in how we manage a commercial herd, I think that's, and that's a trend that's been going on for a long time, I think we'll find more and more ways to leverage genomic knowledge, genetic knowledge, and it'll become a, I think, a tool that, uh, that will be, um, you, I, I, at some point, genomic testing will be a, an SOP for every animal because it'll either be needed for a drug protocol or a culling decision or a breeding decision. I, I, don't, I don't know when that'll be or how that'll be, but I think we have to be open to understanding and finding ways to create value uh, in that regard. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, we can do all the testing we want. I think it's incorporating and how are we going to use that information once we get it. It's important. Um, Declan in Australia, has that uh, practice been promoted and, and used? Certainly there's lots of large herd environments. Uh, what's the landscape there? Yeah, I think Australia has been a little bit slower to catch up on the, you know, on the genomics. Um, and that's just, you know, uh, because, DNA. yeah, it's DNA. DNA. It's just DNA. Um, no, I think uh, uh, what it is, is, you know, I mentioned uh, right at the start that, uh, you know, genomics to me is only as good as your data set. So, you know, Australia obviously don't have a large uh, population of dairy cattle compared to, to the U.S. Uh, so, therefore, our data set isn't as, as large. Um, you know, and, and for me and for a lot of farmers out there in Australia, that, you know, uh, means it's less reliable. Um, so people are more skeptical to use, uh, you know, to use the technology or use the tool um, to, to make those important decisions like Paul mentioned. You know, I think as time goes on and there's some, you know, agencies in Australia, uh, Holston Australia and ADHIS that have, you know, done an amazing job to, you know, to try to grow that data set um, and, you know, by collecting samples from large herds. Uh, and, you know, the more, more data set we can get in there, the, you know, the more samples, you know, the str stronger the technology can be. So, you know, I think in the future if they continue to do that and, and understand the importance of it, you know, I think that technology will certainly grow in, in those larger herd environments. Uh, you know, I certainly think it has a place and, and I certainly think, uh, you know, uh, it, it, under our system, you know, they have certain traits like Paul touched on with, you know, the mastitis resistance and uh, feed efficiency. Australia's uh, been very uh, good at capturing that information, you know, over, over the years. So, you know, I think it will, uh, will continue to grow, in, you know, in those large, large dairies. So. Yeah, good, Declan. Thank you. Um, open it up to the floor. I've got a couple questions for the guys, but I certainly um, would like to uh, open it up to the floor for questions for this, uh, this global panel. We don't get uh, utilize these guys very much. Usually we're at an event where they're pretty attracted to lots of other uh, um, actions, so I certainly open it up to the floor. Declan, I was the one question that came to my mind was the other day I was in, it was in California, I was, I was in the supermarket and, and there was a my first experience, and I don't get out very much, so I don't get to travel very often to see what could be out there, but it was my first experience the other day in California when I went to the store to, of a bottle of A2A2 milk, and I, certainly the first time I ever heard A2A2 was in Australia, and then when I got my updates for the sale catalog yesterday, I was inputting A2A2 into the catalog. So it's one thing I wanted to, you know, ask you about, particularly in Australia, this, this audience, you know, that haven't been there and mm -hmm. it, it adapted it or grasped that A2A2 perspective of protein in the milk, certainly as quicker as, as, quicker as anybody. And now it's starting to, I noticed it in California the other day. Give a little background on that and, and how those dairymen get rewarded, mm -hmm. if you will, w within your country. Which heifer are you going to buy? <laughs> A, a violation. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> Peak. Um, yeah, no, Roger, uh, certainly uh, A2, A2 milk has, uh, uh, you know, has been growing in Australia. Uh, you know, it's probably started, well, it started probably six years ago. Uh, you know, the technology came out of New Zealand, so it was quite ho uh, close, closer to home. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the industry in Australia has done a, an amazing job of, uh, of kind of marketing uh, the product. 
so you, when you go down to Australia, you, you know, you hear, uh, you know, on the radio, uh, you see on the TV, uh, you know, you see ads about A2, A2 milk. So, you know, uh, certainly it's uh, changed the industry down there uh, because, you know, that's a, it's a premium. Uh, so it's like organic milk, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, the farmer's getting a, prayed, a premium for A2. So obviously, uh, you know, a, a part of the population in your herd is going to be an A2, AT positive. And so what a lot of uh, herds uh, have done in Australia in recent times is tested their whole herd, and then the A2 positive cows, they'll uh, run in a separate herd. Uh, they put them in a different milk tank and uh, they get a premium for that milk. Uh, so, you know, for a little bit of extra work to have two different herds, um, you know, you're getting a paid a premium on the A2 milk. Uh, you know, the industry have certainly uh, have, have adapted the technology. Uh, you know, it's certainly quite popular in, a, in the country, and I, I think it will grow uh, around the world, uh, you know, as more markets, uh, you know, catch on to the, the benefits of A2, A2 milk. So. Well, it's certainly been promoted. I'm just going to just ask a question. Paul's got a couple comments. In that, in that premium, I'm just going to use a number that was referenced. Is it around that 15 to 20 percent premium that those, those dairies will pay the producer? Is that a close proximity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yes. would be correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And which is, you know, particularly one of the dairymen that I spoke to was milking about 3,000 cows, and he had about 1,500 A2A2 cows. So, you know, that was a pretty nice premium check for, for that uh, milk. Um, Paul, you had some comments regarding that. I, uh, just uh, when we when we talk about a couple of these, and these are niches, but uh, I think we also need to realize we we I, I got thinking about after somebody said, uh, you know, how much genetic improvement are we willing to give up for pulled? Well, uh, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, intuitively, you should say you shouldn't change the efficiency because of pulled. But if we were to try and look at uh, look at our business a little bit more like Coke or Pepsi does. We'd say if we could start a campaign where we said we've reduced the need to to uh, uh, dehorn animals, we've we've made them mastitis resistant so they don't need drugs, and we've made the milk a healthier product. You know, maybe with the price we'd get for the little bit less milk we'd make might be more valuable. Now, I, I'm always skeptical about how that uh, trickles down to to the level of the breeding population and the and the producing population because generally. It's, it's uh, Danone and uh, Fonterra that are going to make the money on that. But it, it, is, it is something to think about or something I maybe hadn't thought as much about until these days is if we put out those three press releases instead of, of some of the others that we're faced with, would we, would we have more, more demand and then more opportunity to, uh, to exploit our product? So it's, it's not always, uh, it's probably why I'm not on the AI panel, but you know, it's not always about the last little bit of genetic improvement. It's also about making sure we have a, a sustainable industry for a real long time. And so we can make three real good news stories. Uh, maybe we don't need to make the last two pounds of protein improvement. I think that's uh, certainly valued. Um, our consumer is, uh, is our driver behind uh, their quality product, certainly. Um, from the far, Dan? Uh, Dan Retzke. Yep, we got you. Is it on? You're live. Oh, yep. okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say how uh, great it is to work with the Butler View family, uh, right from Jeff all the way, including Todd and Declan and Ashley, and even their farmhands are great. They make me breakfast when I'm there. <laughs> um, but anyway, Declan, uh, not that I don't uh, believe every single word you ever tell me or email me or uh, text me, but I've seen a few raised eyebrows when I tell people that I have six out of the first six bulls likely going to stud. So now that you're not under oath here with a hand down a Bible or anything, but, uh, you know, with God and everybody that's here, uh, is that a likelihood or not? Um, well, I was telling someone uh, yesterday, Dan, after you said that, there's another tab on your spreadsheet that you missed, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think he's saying, watch out where the next six don't go. So. <laughs> you can have a barbecue. Declan was his part politician, so you can uh, certainly believe every word that he says, but he's, uh, he's got a, certainly a good character to drive it forward. So we're pretty much on schedule, and I uh, certainly want to try and keep that as we're wrapping up, uh, you know, towards some, some good social evening and some opportunities. Uh, uh, this evening with the with the live cat with the sale, and um, with that, we're going to take a short break and come back uh, to wrap up. And we got a, certainly another presentation, but uh, certainly with the global, the 